Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Dirk, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Saturday night keynote speech in the uh, uh, 2011 Brisbane Festival of Ideas. Um, as uh, my colleague said a little earlier, we've got a full house this evening. So um, bear in mind, if you need to leave, we'd ask that you leave through the rear doors, if necessary, rather than the front door. And as you're leaving, if you could leave your email address so that the organisers can send you some hate mail. Just. <laughs> Just before we uh, have our keynote address this evening, we're going to have a shorter address uh, from uh, young, oh, I shouldn't say young, it's too patronising, from Johnny Hunt, who is a young science uh, student, and his address will be demanding a better deal from public science. Can I ask you to welcome Johnny Hunt? Thank you, Anthony. Um, I can't see you anymore, but I trust you're all still there. Um, so I just want to start with a very important disclaimer that what I'm about to say represents my own personal views and they doesn't necessarily represent any of the institutes I might be affiliated with. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is basically you're about to hear about keeping politicians honest and that's probably a far more important problem so reserve most of your mental power for that but uh, just briefly I want to talk about the idea of keeping scientists honest which is probably a little less of what you hear about. Um, so I'm a baby professional scientist, meaning I'm just about to finish, hopefully, uh, my PhD. Um, and I want to convince you tonight of two things. Number one, that you should keep funding science. When I say you, I mean you, the public, the taxpayer, the people that foot the bills. And two, you should demand a better return on your investment. Now the first part's not very controversial among scientists. Um, the second part, maybe. So science, I believe, is an exciting and incredibly useful way of discovering knowledge. At its heart, it's really just what a child does naturally. Figuring, figuring out the world by trying things out and not believing anything without evidence, no matter how well-dressed the person saying it is. Of course, this elegant approach to knowledge sometimes takes a lot of time and fancy equipment and so we pay people to do it for a living. And I'm very privileged to um, be in that position at the moment. Now, why does the public pay? Well, it pays because science is both interesting and contributes to our intellectual um, development as a society, but also useful. In a very important sense, science is responsible, more or less, for most of the modern world. Now, recently, the government threatened to reduce um, medical research around budget, uh, funding for medical research, and it led to some protests, and, and it was reversed. And I want to say, I think those protests were entirely justified. Science is a really good way of spending public money for long-term benefit. I really believe that, and I completely support those protests. But, much like you shouldn't just ask drug companies as the only people for how to do, uh, for public drug policy, don't forget that scientists can sometimes also be an insular group. I believe that scientists have sometimes forgotten that we too are public servants. You are paying our salaries and you should demand a better return. The status quo, perhaps not so well known outside of science, is that scientists are paid largely to do research in their field and communicate that research to one another in specialized journals. That, by and large, most scientists in private will tell you is almost everything that matters for their career advancement. Teaching, communicating to the public, inspiring people, solving pressing practical problems are often not rewarded and in fact can sometimes be used as an example of a lack of commitment to real science. One classic example of this is Harvard denied tenure to Carl Sagan. One of the greatest science communicators of the 20th century couldn't keep his job because he was wasting his time writing bestsellers. Worse than that, you can't even read most of our technical writing because it's in, expensive, it's in journals which are um, not open to the public. You have to pay money to read them. You can't read most of the research that you paid for. That's not because there's, lack, there's a lack of better ways of doing science. There are many open access journals, meaning that when you publish work in them, the public can read them for free. There are many examples of scientists doing fantastic work on good teaching, communicating, inspiring the public, 
visiting schools, and working on very practical problems that help society in very direct ways. But, as I said before, scientists doing these are largely not rewarded for in their involvement, and in fact, sometimes this affects their careers negatively. And this, of course, leads to such activities being neglected, inevitably. I believe this is outrageous. We publicly fund other types of intellectuals, artists, writers, and on a good day, even politicians. And we've moved beyond the paternalistic approach of allowing them to be self-serving communities. We demand that we fund them, and therefore that they deal with us and benefit us. Imagine, for instance, a publicly funded artist who refused to let anyone except other professional artists see their exhibits. They wouldn't say pu stay publicly funded for very long. There's a simple answer to changing the status quo in science. You pay the bills, you make the rules. In the US, a very important public funding agency will not give money for research unless you agree that the results from that research are gonna be made freely publicly available. You can demand that money be spent, that money spent on science go for public benefit so that scientists are actually encouraged to communicate with, with the outside world, so that the Carl Sagans are encouraged and keep their jobs. But I just wanna end by clarifying that I may have come, across, uh, this sounds very pessimistic it sounds like I'm saying scientists are a bunch of self-serving scum ripping you off. But I really aren't. In fact, by and large, my experience has been that scientists um, are generally excellent people. And that despite the status quo lack of rewards for many of these important activities, you will still find many scientists do write blogs, they visit classrooms, they work hard at teaching, even when it's not rewarded very well. Why? because they are passionate, smart, interested people who can't help it. <laughs> the status quo suppresses these instincts to the detriment of both the scientists and society. And it sometimes leads to very good scientists seeking careers elsewhere. And so this is a plea from a baby scientist to the public. Demand a better return for your investment in public science because it'll make my job more fun. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Um, let me now introduce uh, our keynote speaker this evening, Mr. Julian Burnside QC. What can you say about Julian that hasn't already been said behind his back? A very few, no, I withdraw that immediately. Julian uh, is a barrister, an author, and a very strong supporter of the arts. Um, as a barrister myself, albeit of a much more junior rank, uh, I can observe that he is one of a decreasing number of my colleagues whom I can uh, honestly say does not bring my profession into disrepute. Will you please welcome Mr. Julian Burnside. Thank you very much. Um, it was only this morning when I arrived in Brisbane that I saw the program for the Festival of Ideas and noticed that the overarching theme was happiness, sustainability, and good food. I hadn't known it until then. I imagine my dismay. When <laughs> I tried to match that along with the topic which I had been given and wondered where the, the, the two intersected. I decided that they didn't. <laughs> but I was, um, my happiness was greatly increased this afternoon when between 4.30 and 5.30, I sat down with about 20 young people who had been uh, four of them had been part of the um, soapbox competition and Johnny was the winner of that and that's why he was speaking a moment ago. And uh, the others were, from, were either finalists or were from a group called Left Right or it may be Right Left but whichever. Um, and, and these are young people who are concerned about the low level of public discourse in Australia. And I must say, it made me feel very cheerful to think that there are at least some members of Generation Y who are thinking the way those kids are thinking. Um, so thank goodness for that. The other thing I want to say is, I'm happy to see that there are quite a lot of you here. Um, when I noticed it was raining, I assumed that the auditorium would be empty, this being Brisbane. <laughs> um, now, the 
topic that you will have seen in the program isn't necessarily the topic I'm going to talk about, although it's a starting off point. Um, and let me make it clear, I'm not here to criticise politicians, but to plead with them on your behalf and mine. And I hope it will become clear what I mean by that. So, first, a straw poll. Um, hands up if you think that politicians mislead us. Oh, golly. If there are any politicians in the room, I hope they notice that. <laughs> Second, hands up if you think it matters that they mislead us. Hmm. Oh, yes, only one person who put their hand up before didn't put it up then. <laughs> I noticed uh, in Ho the Hobart Mercury um, in the second half of 2008, there was a headline article, Voter Angst. And the, the secondary uh, headline was, Lack of Trust a telling poll issue. Um, so I guess it seems that more people agree with you than disagree with you. Now, the headline idea that's in the program, um, I first mentioned at the 2020 summit in 2008. Um, it was quite interesting. It got three quite distinct reactions from three quite distinct groups. Well, Jared Henderson, if you can regard him as a group, uh, <laughs> reacted, he was in the same stream as I was in in 2020, and he fulminated and, and, and um, protested that politicians, in fact, don't mislead us. Um, therefore, he thought my idea was idiotic. Although, he might have gone on and said that if they don't mislead us, well, then my idea would do no harm. Um, the second was the public, and the public seemed to be very enthusiastic about it. And that was good. The third group was the politicians, who were conspicuously silent. Not a single politician I met during the entire weekend mentioned the idea at all, picked it up, discussed it, even in order to put it down. And that was, that was interesting and disappointing in a way because 2020 was micromanaged within an inch of its life um, and so my idea never quite made it uh, through to the actual dignity of being discussed, uh, criticised or enlarged on. Although, um, true to the promise, we got a formal response to all of the B rating ideas um, some months later, and the formal response to my idea was, quote, not supported, politicians are accountable at elections every three years. <laughs> now, that's true in a sense, but of course entirely irrelevant. It's irrelevant because I can't remember the last time a politician was knocked out an at an election simply because they'd been caught out lying to the public or misleading the public. I can think of a couple of conspicuous examples of the reverse happening. Um, you cast your minds back to 2001, the post-Tampa election. Um, uh, just towards the election, you may remember that um, uh, a story called Children Overboard got running. It didn't sound credible, but um, important politicians were uh, backing it and running with it and um, they won the election, at least in part, off the back of that story. After the election was over, there was a Senate inquiry which found that the whole thing was completely false. And uh, to his credit, Angus Houston uh, came out and told the Senate that there was in fact no foundation for the rumour that had got going, but which had provided such support for the government in its um, bid for re-election. Despite having been caught out in that barefaced lie, the government was returned with an increased majority in 2004. That struck me as rather, um, a, um, well, a salutary illustration of the fact that being caught out lying and being accountable at every election doesn't necessarily mean that the truth will govern the result. Um, so now, let me give a couple of other illustrations. I don't want to talk too much about politicians' lies because they will think I'm criticising them and I'm really not. So let me spread it around a bit. Before the Vietnam War, before Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War, do you remember Sir Robert Menzies told us that the US had asked us to take part? Turns out they hadn't. Um, Lyndon Johnson explained that uh, it was essential because there'd been an attack in the, in the Gulf of Tonkin, but there hadn't. Um, you may remember that we recently entered another war. Actually, it's quite a long time ago now, eight years we've been in Iraq. Why? Weapons of mass destruction. Where were they? Ah, that was a mistake. Bin Laden, more recently. Osama bin Laden uh, was gunned down in his compound in Abbottabad 
And um, a number of political leaders said that he had been brought to justice. Well, what conception of justice is it that a man who's unarmed is simply gunned down in front of one of his wives? The press, of course, would have you believe that he was, he was hurling wives at the, at the invading forces <laughs> while standing on a pile of kittens <laughs> and admitting to child abuse. Um, brought to justice, he was most certainly not. In fact, I think it would improve political discourse in this country and others if someone could have called it by its proper name. He was assassinated in a country uh, which had been temporarily invaded by the Americans. Now, you can... Uh, uh, bin Laden may have been the most dreadful person in the world. I don't know. I haven't seen the evidence. But uh, the idea of an extrajudicial killing, an assassination by one state uh, on the citizen of another state strikes me as a little bit worrying and doesn't fit comfortably in the same sentence as the word justice. Now, all of that said, let me explain what the idea actually is because, of course, um, people tend to distort these ideas. The idea essentially is this. Um, there is a provision in the Trade Practices Act called Section 52. And Section 52 is probably the most powerful one-sentence provision in any statute on the Australian statute book. It was introduced as an afterthought when Lionel Murphy was preparing the Trade Practices Act in 1974. And it says that a corporation must not, in trade or commerce, engage in conduct which is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. That single, single sentence has been the engine of growth of the federal court's jurisdiction. It has been the subject of thousands and thousands of judgments, and it has introduced a new norm of proper conduct into commercial life in Australia. Um, now, what it means is that if a person engages in conduct which is misleading or deceptive, they contravene the Act. Um, it does not mean that if you say something which turns out to be false, you have therefore contravened. Uh, a representation, a, a misleading statement, has to be a, a statement of present fact, which is incorrect. So if you make a prediction about the future and it doesn't turn out the way you predicted, you're not necessarily guilty of misleading people. If you make a promise which you ultimately can't fulfil, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've been acting in a misleading way. Um, if you express an opinion, then no matter how foolish the opinion is, it doesn't mean necessarily that you have been acting in a misleading way. What the courts have said in the Section 52 context is, if you put, make a prediction for the future and you had no reasonable foundation for making that prediction, then that will be misleading conduct. Because making the prediction carries with it an implied representation that you've got some reasonable foundation for it. If you express an opinion which is nonsensical and which you do not hold, that's misleading conduct. Why? Because expressing an opinion carries with it the implied suggestion that that is an opinion you hold. So bear in mind the crucial distinction between statements which are misleading and statements which just turn out to be wrong. Now, taking the idea forward, what do we have in mind? Well, what I'm suggesting is that politicians should be responsible if in their capacity as politicians they act in a way which is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. It does not mean that every electoral promise which doesn't come good will engage the provision. Uh, what it does mean is that they'll have to be a little bit more careful when they express views because if they express a view which they actually don't hold, if they're just towing the party line and expressing views which do not represent their true opinion, that would be misleading. If they make a prediction for which they have no foundation, that would be misleading. Uh, if they express a view about the size of children who were thrown overboard, as Philip Ruddock did in a famous interview when the Children Overboard story was running, he was asked what size children were thrown overboard. And he said, well, I expect it would be about the size of, a child, the size of children who wouldn't uh, be able to object to being tossed. <laughs> I suppose it's logical, I guess, but... <laughs> It does seem to take invention just a bit far. Now, wh why does this matter? Why does it matter at all? I think it's an important question because in, in, instinctively it seems to matter. But I think it matters for a few reasons. The first is that honesty is, after all, one of the core values in our society. We expect honesty in our personal relationships, in our family relationships. We expect honesty in business dealings. 
And of course the politicians expect honesty of each other. It's a grave parliamentary crime to mislead the parliament. Now they're doing a very important job and it seems to me highly undesirable that they should be allowed to mislead us when they are conducting the affairs of the country on our behalf. Um, the importance of their job I think puts a premium on the significance of them not misleading us. Um, there's another fundamentally different way in which it is important that parliamentarians should be held to account if they mislead us. And it is that it will tend to extend the policy horizon. At the moment, plainly enough, politicians are prepared to set policies and deal with policy settings that will bear fruit between now and the next election. And that's why the second 18 months of a government's term tend to be a policy-free zone. Um, it's, it's interesting to set this in a practical setting. Imagine, for example, climate change, which I think is a, a fairly real topic to consider. No matter what your view about it, it's an important subject. And in the wake of the dreadful floods up here and the Cyclone Yasi, uh, I would have thought that um, people living in Queensland might be reconsidering their attitudes to climate change and thinking perhaps the world scientists have got something uh, going. Um, if parliament parliamentarians could be held to account for engaging in misleading conduct, then it seems to me that if they were asked what they thought of climate change, they would have a choice. They could either, either say, I think it's crap, as long as they believe that, and that would not be misleading. They would take the consequences of that view. They could say that they think it's real and anthropogenic, provided that was their view. But if as a matter of party policy, they said it's not real or it's not caused by human activity, whilst in their heart of hearts they believed that it was real and was caused by human activity, that would be misleading conduct. If they could be held to account for matters like that, it seems to me that we might have started the public discussion about climate change a decade before we actually did. And if parliamentarians, or politicians rather, were responsible for misleading conduct, then maybe questions about climate change right now would be dealt with in a way somewhat different from the way in which they are being dealt with. There's a very interesting survey done uh, last year which um, asked politicians, both from federal, state and local government levels, their attitude to the fact or otherwise of climate change and whether or not it was anthropogenic. Interestingly, those who supported the coalition, uh, only 38% thought that climate change was real and anthropogenic. Of those who were unaligned politically, 57% thought that it was real and anthropogenic. Now, I don't understand why a matter of science should divide along party lines, at least not if they're being honest. Now, it does seem to be a, a matter of very real concern if either, or perhaps both, major parties are formulating policies about climate change, not with a view to the truth, but with a view to see what will sell in the public arena. And that, as it seems to me, is what you get if they can, with impunity, mislead us about their real views. The um, uh, more fundamental importance of this proposal is somehow to do with self-respect. Um, I, I think that politicians, um, some of them at least, must go through real agony when having to support ideas in which they do not believe when they have to go out and spruik ideas which they do not believe. I think it was to his credit that Malcolm Turnbull was able to sacrifice the leadership of the coalition because he was not prepared to say that he didn't believe in climate change, when in truth he does believe in it and wanted to take action. You don't see that sort of political courage very often in Australia these days. In fact, I think you probably have to go back to the 1970s to get examples of that sort of political courage. But in addition, um, whilst uh, sanctions for engaging in misleading conduct would liberate 
parliamentarians, because after all, they'd be able to say to their party colleagues, I'm not going to contravene the law by saying things I don't believe, therefore I will either say nothing on this policy or I'll say what I actually think. But in addition, it would show a much greater respect for the public than is presently shown in this country. It's a distressing thing to look at polit politics in Australia these days and see that they speak, they don't say very much often, we make a choice between the major parties and then whoever comes in ends up disappointing us because pretty much everything they've told us turns out either not to be real or no longer operative, not a core promise. Um, in any event, however they explain it, we don't get what we thought we were going to get. Um, there's, an, an, uh, I think, a very simple explanation for this, and that is the way policies are formed in the major parties these days. Unlike uh, politics in Australia up to the 1970s, it seems to me that the policies are formed in both major parties not by reference to their founding principles, not by reference to the philosophy which provides the central guidance for their thinking, but by reference to news polls and focus groups, typically in the mar marginal electorates where elections are won and lost. That means that a small handful of people in marginal electorates are in effect ca calling the, not only the policy settings of the country, but also the outcome of the elections in the country. And that doesn't seem to me to serve the ideals of democracy very effectively. Now, one aspect of this, or perhaps one piece of evidence for this, um, is on a subject which is close to my heart, and that is how should Australia treat boat people? And it's very interesting to see what's happened with government policy over recent years in connection with the treatment of boat people and to line that up against public attitudes at large. Um, during the Howard years, um, as everyone remembers, the government was conspicuously and vocally hostile to uh, boat people and made a virtue of locking them up, treating them harshly in order to send a message uh, so that no one else would dare follow in their footsteps and ask for our help. Um, when the Rudd government uh, came into office, they changed policies very fundamentally. In July of 2008, Senator Evans announced a whole new philosophy of immigration detention and the treatment of boat people and it was, I think it's fair to say, about 90% of what a number of us had been arguing for for a number of years. The Rudd government, on the other hand, changed its attitude to uh, boat people radically after one single event. And that event was Tony Abbott taking control of the coalition. Because when Tony Abbott took control of the coalition, he began beating the drum about people smugglers, which is just a code for beating up on boat people because if there aren't people smugglers, there can't be boat people. Um, what happened then was uh, an increasing uh, clamour between the leaders of the two parties, uh, echoed in the press, um, the general thesis of which was, we will break the people smuggling industry and uh, you know, we will stop the boat arrivals. Now, this, it's uh, apparent, is a reflection of polling in the marginal electorates. Um, that's very plain. It was plain before the last election. It is very clear that both of the major parties thought we need to find a policy which will resonate in the marginals and this is what it is. Interestingly, um, there's, a, there's just a tinge of misleading conduct in the public rhetoric about people smugglers. The, the misleading character of that rhetoric is that when they say people smugglers are dreadful, evil people engaged in a wicked and dangerous trade, what they really want to achieve is no more boat arrivals. In other words, no more refugees coming here by boat. The only way you can uh, responsibly, I mean, the only, the only conceivable consequence of breaking the people smuggling trade is that the people will not be able to come here by boats anymore. Now, it's very easy to beat up on people smugglers. Um, Tony Abbott loves doing it, although I wish he'd be more concerned with budgie smugglers than people smugglers. <laughs> but um, he set the hair running and Rudd fell into step with it very quickly. Um, Rudd declared that people smugglers were the vilest of all possible people. He seems to have overlooked the fact that his hero, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was himself a people smuggler. 
Both major parties have overlooked the fact that Oscar Schindler, whom we so admired in the book and in the film, was a people smuggler. Um, both of them seem to have overlooked the fact that Captain Schroeder, the heroic captain of the uh, SS, uh, SS St. Louis, which embarked from Hamburg in May of 1939 with 900 Jewish refugees on board, took them all around the world trying to find a place of safety for them, got pushed from pillar to post, no one wanted boat people arriving and eventually they were sent back to Europe where they disembarked and more than half of them perished in concentration camps. Captain Schroeder did it for the money. He was a people smuggler but he was also a hero trying to do something which was conspicuously worth doing. And if I can reach into the annals of fiction, let's not forget that the Von Trapp family in The Sound of Music were <laughs> refugees and the nuns were people smugglers. <laughs> it's just foolish to say that they're all equally vile. And, you know, they may be mercenary. I'll tell you a story. Um, we, uh, the, the, we had a, a Hazara Afghan living in our house for about five years. And the Hazaras, of course, are the, the sworn enemies of the Taliban, who are all Pashtun. And the Hazaras have a couple of distinctive disadvantages. They look Asian and they are Shiite Muslims, uh, whereas the Pashtun uh, don't look Asian and are Sunni Muslims. So the Hazaras um, have a shocking time in Afghanistan, especially under the Taliban. Now, um, Rahmat was telling us that uh, he went to a people smuggler and his people smuggler had a set tariff. This much gets you to Australia. This much more gets you to Europe. This much more gets you to America. But for Hazaras, half price. Because even he as a Pashtun could see the Hazaras were having a terrible time. Now, he may have been mercenary, he may have been a careless, nasty person, but he couldn't have been all bad if he's offering his enemy a discount to help him escape. So, um, you know, be careful. Don't fall into step with all of this rhetoric about people smugglers because it's not entirely honest and it is code for we don't want boat people. Um, Incidentally, <clears throat> uh, I said that the, the government uh, uh, and the opposition are forming their policies by reference to uh, attitudes in the marginal electorates. A number of people in the marginal electorates write to me. Um, they write really quite ferocious emails. Um, rather more for between 2001 and 2006, um, but recently uh, they've started up again, one in particular who's extremely rude. Um, it's, but it's an interesting test, it's an interesting marker of public attitudes because between 2001 and 2005 or 6, um, whenever I said anything publicly about um, boat people and refugee policy and so on, um, I would get a torrent of hate mail from people and um, I would actually answer them all and um, actually have I got time to tell a little story about that? Yeah. It's completely off the subject but, <laughs> but it's, it's good fun and it's true. Um, I, I, I formed the view, you see, that if we were going to change the government's policy in relation to boat people, it was really necessary to change the public attitude to boat people because clearly the whole thing was poll driven. So I thought what I've got to do is try and persuade enough people in Australia that beating up on refugees is a bad thing to do and we need to do it, you know, we need to do things better. So when people write hate mail to you, clearly they are people whose views d differ from mine and who need to be persuaded and brought around. So I resolved that I would answer them all. Now, um, people who write hate mail by letter and stamp are a very forgetful folk and generally don't include a return address, so you can't do much about that. But if they email, as most of them did, all you have to do is hit the reply button and you can, you can answer them, so that was good. So I would sit up late at night and bite my tongue furious emails, you know, sort of casting doubt on my, in, in sort of my honesty, my intelligence, my legitimacy, my parentage, <laughs> everything. And um, I'd say, dear so-and-so, thank you for your email. I gather you don't agree with me. But did you realise, give them a few key facts. And to my surprise, almost all of them answered. And every answer I got was polite, from being flaming capital letters, rude words, a whole lot, done, boom, very calm, very polite. Um, and they divided into two broad categories. One category would say, in substance, um, 
thank you for answering my email. I didn't expect to hear from you. Um, um, I understand those points. I didn't realise that. But what about such and such? And I would then write back and say, well, actually, here are some more facts that deal with the such and such. And the other group, astonishingly, um, wrote back saying, in substance, thank you for replying. I didn't expect to hear from you. Uh, I didn't realise that. I agree with you now. <laughs> and at the end of it, overall, I reckon, after the exchanges were complete, about 50% of them ended up saying that they now agreed with me. And about another 25% ended up saying, in substance, well, look, I don't agree with you, but good on you for standing up for something that you believe in. And the remaining 25% thought I was an idiot. <laughs> uh, but a very interesting illustration that um, there is still room for polite conversation and um, a polite response is sometimes more effective than uh, a rude response. But one exception. A couple of years later, a few years later, when it was all quiet, um, I got an email out of the blue from a bloke and it said, and I quote, you're a fuckwit. What means, wh why do you think that being a QC means anyone who's interested in listening to your opinions, why don't you fuck off and die? <laughs> now, uh, just ask yourself, how do you engage intellectually <laughs> with these propositions? And especially because the middle proposition is something I completely agree with. But I, w I didn't want to tell him that. Uh, and so I, I wrote back and said, dear so-and-so, uh, thank you for your email. The offer of your sister is interesting. Please send photographs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I had a sort of wave of pleasure as I hit the send button that paid for all of the angst of the previous years. So imagine my surprise when he replied. <laughs> and his reply said, I, sh uh, uh, um, I suppose I was a bit over the top. <laughs> so I thought, OK, there's a rational mind there after all. So I replied, saying, that's OK, I don't mind. But I'm interested to know this. I've been talking about this stuff for quite a few years now. Did you just stumble on it, or did it all get too much for you? <laughs> and he answered, saying, I suppose I should come clean. I'd just had a huge night out. I met a bloke I couldn't stand. We were arguing about refugees. I probably should have written to him. For some reason, I wrote to you. <laughs> Actually, I think you're doing quite a good job, so please ignore me. <laughs> I, thought that was, I thought that was pretty good. Um, Actually, it's probably the only win I've had in 10 years, <laughs> at least on, on this issue. Um, <clears throat> but then it was interesting. When it all flared up again and Abbott started beating the drum and I would get asked to, you know, express opinions and write opinion pieces and so on, um, I found that I got emails again, but most of them were saying, in substance, thank you for speaking out. Very few of them were rude, inflammatory or expressing disagreement. There are a couple of exceptions, and one in particular who's, who keeps on writing very rude things, even though I've sent him the, the s photographs of your sister email. <laughs> he just keeps on at it. So, um, but the, the balance changed dramatically. Uh, in the past, it might have been 100 rude emails to one or two supportive emails. Now, it's, it's, it's 100 supportive emails to half a dozen um, um, critical, uh, offensive ones. And that seems to... That suggests to me, although it's patchy and anecdotal, that the public attitude is not the same as it was in 2001. And in support of that, the um, Red Cross did a survey last year in which they found that approximately 85% of the community supported a more humane treatment of boat people. So what's going on when the two major parties between them can fabricate this debate about people smugglers and the people smuggling trade and sending people to East Timor or Manus Island or Malaysia. Uh, and the press love it because it's a fight. But I think that both of them now have adopted policies, not very different policies, by the way, um, policies which don't reflect the public attitude. And it seems to me that if parliamentary politicians were to be held to account for engaging in misleading conduct, it would be much less likely that you would find politicians standing up and waving the flag for policies which they did not agree with 
for policies which they knew represented only the uh, fragment of opinion in a few electorates, albeit important marginal electorates. And I long for the day when this country will see parliamentarians who are willing to say, uh, on this issue, there are questions of principle and I will lose the election rather than abandon the principle that I believe in. That's something that those of you who are old enough to remember the 1960s and 70s, you would have seen that then. You don't see it anymore. And this country is the poorer for that change. Um, this brings me to the problem with uh, elections in this country, and especially the last election, which was all about image pitching. Uh, there was nothing real in it. It seemed to me that you, you could look long and hard and you would not find any substance in the uh, campaigns of either major party. And this is, I mean, I, I know this seems a long way off my topic, but in fact, it brings me back to the starting point because the public at large do not want bullshit. We want sincerity. We want people who are saying to us what they believe. We want to be able to elect people to parliament to run this country on the footing that what they tell us is what they actually think. Because we don't want people running the country whose views have got nothing to do with our opinions, whose real views aren't communicated to us, and whose stated views and adopted policies only reflect um, what they think is going to be acceptable in some key seats. Sincerity is something that is almost entirely absent in Australian politics now. But I do want to mention three conspicuous uh, exceptions to that, and perhaps by being exceptional, they illustrate the point. The first was Kevin Rudd's apology to the Stolen Generations uh, in February of 2008. That was not a great speech, but there was no doubting the sincerity of it. And there was something about that speech that seemed to galvanise the entire country. Support for the idea of apologising to the Stolen Generations jumped dramatically uh, from the day before he did it to the day after he did it. Because everyone saw that whether or not you agreed with him, he was genuine about it. It was sincere. And that sincerity stood out like a beacon of hope. The second was Anna Bly in the recent floods up here. I watched that from Melbourne on TV, and the thing that was really striking about her was how fair income she was. She was clearly being herself. She was being sincere in everything she did. And I'm sorry to say this, but Julia Gillard alongside her looked like complete, a complete fake. She just didn't seem to mean what she was saying, even though she was saying more or less the same things. Sincerity counts for a great deal in politics. And the third example I've already mentioned, and that's Malcolm Turnbull, who was prepared to sacrifice the leadership in order to stand up for a principle which he regarded as very important. We, uh, if I can borrow a phrase from Abraham Lincoln, we have adopted in this country, as America has adopted there, the principle of government of the people, by the people, for the people. That is not sustainable unless the people care about what is done in our name. What's done to our country's reputation, what's done to the fabric of our society. Now, as I said, my purpose today is not to criticise politicians, but to plead with them, to plead with them through you, for them to think about policies, to form policies in a principled way, to form policies in which they actually believe, and to tell us truly what they think to tell us honestly, sincerely, what it is that they have in mind every time they hold themselves accountable to us at elections. Tell us fearlessly, because they, after all, are running this country in our name, and they hold our future in their hands. And if we can't trust their sincerity, then we are lost. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take some questions now. Just waiting for our microphone volunteers to arrive. Um, when you're called upon to speak, just wait until the microphone's delivered to you because uh, that's a vital uh, cog in the whole recording process. And the first hand that I saw went up is this gentleman here on the right-hand side. Thank you. 
Uh, is it possible that the abolition of compulsory voting might deliver us better politicians? I don't think so. Uh, I, I'm a supporter of compulsory voting because I think it does help concentrate people's minds on the task of participatory democracy. And, um, and I think people do, most people do get quite serious about it, even though they probably wouldn't vote if they had a choice. Um, in addition, it makes it a little bit harder for politicians to play the numbers game. You know, in England, it used to be the case that um, the result of the election would depend on the weather. This is back in the 50s, because uh, people from poorer areas uh, uh, who would traditionally vote Labor didn't have cars, and it was harder for them to get out to vote. And so the weather would actually shift the result in favour of the Conservative Party. Now, I don't think that sort of uh, externality is a useful thing. So I would be sorry to see compulsory voting go. Um, we've got one here. We can bring the microphone down here. Thank you. Um, what I'm interested in is in the dog whistle. I, I think uh, a lot of uh, politicians can't say what they want to say, but and they have to play to the the, the masses. And um, you know, with Alan Jones and you know people like that, sort of riling up the uh, general populace who really don't want to think about you know anything other than what's happening in uh, Australian Idol or something else. Um, they want easy chunk-sized things that they can think of. And you know, like, like looking at Tony Abbott, for instance. You know, the the thing about refugees. If you talk to a lot of the people out there, um, a lot of them have got serious concerns about it. And uh, it's quite easy just to have the dog whistle and say, you know, the evil such and such. But they're actually perhaps not believing it, but it is more about manipulation, you know. So, mm. you know, my thought is how do you actually, you know, re reconcile the fact that politicians have to do the dog whistle and then have a separate belief system? Yeah, look, that's a, a good question. Um, the thing about the dog was, I mean, let, let's be candid about this. The media have a role to play in this, and the media are really not terribly good at pressing for proper answers. They're not good at flushing politicians out. Um, and, and in particular, the media, the electronic media, have the problem that they're going for a 10-second grab, uh, which means that a skilled politician can simply deflect the question until the journalist... Um, runs out of time. They don't get what they need. Um, now, if, if the media were a bit more on the money, I mean, like Chris Yulman, who's a very good political um, uh, um, um, journalist, and, and Tony Jones, also a very good political journalist, prepared to press the questions. Um, if they were prepared to press the questions, then the dog whistle ceases to be quite so effective because you can, you can press to see what's beneath the surface. I mean, you know, I, I would actually quite like to see a few politicians lined up and be forced to answer the question, do you think it's right to treat children cruelly in order to influence the conduct of other people? Is it, is it OK to jail innocent children in order to prevent people fleeing the Taliban from asking for our help? You know, that's where, that's where the ethical rubber hits the road. But they're not asked those questions, and they're not forced to declare their views. I'd be fascinated to hear Tony Abbott, uh, Abbott uh, answer questions like that. But that's, is that not? But that's not the mass media. I mean, that's mm. as far as the rest of them would consider would be mm. the, the the Chardonnay swilling classes who are interested in these things. You know, the, the the people who live in Burke are not really interested in that sort of stuff. You know, the easy uh, thing that comes along for them is what's far more important. You know? Yeah. That's, that's true, uh, unless you assume that the media will be a little more responsible in putting the story out uh, with a little more clarity and maybe a little more detail. And I know that's hard, and the politicians... I mean, there is this really weird dance between the politicians and the press, you know. It's, um, they, de they have a symbiotic relationship which is hard to break. And, of course, with media being as tightly held as they are in Australia, you don't get very much diversity. Um, you know, it's a little bit different in Britain and in America. Um, I, I, think, I think the ultimate answer to the dog whistle is you, you call them on what they're really saying and then get them to declare their position. And if there's a penalty for um, um, saying something that they don't believe in, then maybe we'll get a little more honesty. 
There's someone just, just behind, behind you. you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to actually go further with the one about the media because, um, you know, like you do something like watch the National Press Club on Tuesday, is it Tuesday? And then look in the Australian the next day. And, if you know, there's so little relation <coughs> between what was actually said and what the Australian publishers... We read the Australian out on radio and we make jokes about it being, you know, like it's just... There's so little relation to reality and what actually happens and is said. Well, the politicians are up against it. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to pass on that last phrase because I'm not sure I agree with it, but it's a long subject. Um, I, I agree. There, there's a, a great deal that there, there should be better reporting. It's a pity that there isn't. I mean, you sometimes do get some good stuff in the Australian, but the reporting is often very skewed. You know, they have their agenda. And in Melbourne, of course, we've got the Herald Sun and a columnist like Andrew Bolt. And if you've ever had the pleasure of staying in Melbourne, um, there's nothing like reading Andrew Bolt to brighten up a rainy day. <laughs> <laughs> At least it makes you feel a bit warmer. <laughs> um, it's... I frankly do not know. I, um, was discussing exactly this problem yesterday with someone who knows a great deal about these things and he couldn't suggest any solution to it except we need to expand media ownership. And that's not going to happen because our demographics and geography make that pretty expensive and pretty difficult. But social media might be the way through. It may be that in a decade from now when social media have become more sophisticated and passed through their adolescent phase, uh, it could be that we get the sort of coverage that we need um, without the blockage of editorial uh, control. If, hypothetically, we had Tony Abbott charged with dece deception, would he have a defence because he's publicly stated, don't believe everything I say? <laughs> <laughs> um... The strict legal answer is no, it wouldn't make any difference unless he said the two things side by side. In other words, here's something, don't believe it. <coughs> on, on the reported cases, that would, that, would, uh, that, that would cancel out. By the way, just a little follow-on to the previous question. Um, I was really impressed with the people I was speaking to from left, right, just before this session started, because they were, they, these were people in their early 20s, I guess, who were acutely aware of how impoverished the public discourse is. Now, it is a sign of hope when the next generation and the one beyond are thinking that way. As if we had the time. Uh, you said many things, and there's no doubt that uh, we are the majority and we do stand alone against media, um, government and a whole range of other things, OK? So how does a majority, which has the minority voice, which puts the majority into power, what is your solution where we can gain access to have some control over that? Going back to the other gentleman is that we don't have a hope with <coughs> compulsory voting and yet, it's, in my own view, it's absolutely necessary for us. And the other thing is I don't really think that we have lost the Ned Kelly uh, Eureka uh, value within us, it's just that for somehow we aren't stepping up for it either and we don't seem to know the roadway to do that. If we decide not to go to the polls and vote to show our uh, um, sadness about how politicians are treating us, how are you going to defend me considering I've broken the law? Right. Well, hang on. Uh, there's quite a few questions in there. Um, first of all, um, the idea of... Um, you know, the, the notion of don't vote, it only encourages them. Um, that's well and good as long as everyone in the electorate adopts the same stance. I mean, it would be a fabulous thing if, you know, you know, any, you know choose your electorate according to your preferences, um, if every voter in that electorate decided not to cast a ballot. That would be sensational. The problem is there will always be um, uh, a group who want to vote because they're really keen to get X or Y uh, elected. And, and then the thing breaks down, and then when good people like you decide, no, as a protest, I'm not going to vote, then all you do is end up with the other people dictating the outcome. 
So, you know, it's a nice idea, but I think it doesn't work. Um, I'm interested, this is a little off the t topic, but I was interested you referred to the Ned Kelly and Eureka spirit. It's an interesting reflection on Australia's rather contradictory attitudes to things that Eureka and Ned Kelly both hold positions of real prominence in our historical narrative. They are the two great terrorist offences in Australia's history. There is no question whatever that on the facts those both fit within the definition of terrorism as it presently stands in the Australian statute books. How curious then that we are progressively sacrificing our democratic principles and fundamentals in order to combat terrorism. As if... Pardon me? That's why we came here in the first place. Ah, uh, well, it depends on when you came. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some came here in chains, so they didn't have much choice. <laughs> Hi, Julian. Probably on a, on a broader level from the area of uh, political philosophy and political science. That's um, good, because I know nothing about those <laughs> subjects, let me tell you. <laughs> in um, fact, don't believe anything I've said. <laughs> um, do you think that individualism and, and the, the sort of the, the growth of neoliberalism, particularly over the last 30 years, sort of negates a sense of collective or shared responsibility for, for much of our sort of problems, great big problems that we face as a, as a uh, society? And um, is, is that likely to sort of change any time soon? Um, if I were to point to one national characteristic that explains what's going on, I think it would be complacency. Complacency is actually a very agreeable Australian characteristic. You know, we are not hot-headed, we don't have elections every 12 months, we don't have riots in the streets about things. Um, you know, Australians are very good tolerant, easygoing people by and large. But the problem is that complacency can mean that you're right over the edge of the cliff before you realise that something's gone wrong. And um, I think we cop much more than we ought to cop from politicians who, for whatever reason, have now come to the point where they think it's, you know, being sincere to us is just optional. We're and we, we really should be cross about it. We should be cross, and, and maybe coming back to your question, what are we going to do? I reckon what you need to do is, is bother the politicians with it. Get on to them, complain about it. Ask them what their views are. You'll get back a pro forma letter from their press secretary, write again to them, say that's a bullshit answer. I, I want, you didn't even deal with the question. Here's what I'm asking, tell me again. I'm in your electorate, I'm entitled to know. You know, and now it takes a bit of effort. I think the effort is probably worth it. Well. Keep pursuing them. Keep pursuing them. There's a limit. And, and, of course, if they keep on sending back the same pro forma answer, well, then write to the newspaper. Get on to the ABC. There's actually quite an interesting story if you keep asking the same question and you keep getting the same non-answer. You know, that's interesting. And it's... Well, enough said. We are up against the clock, as ever, on this very interesting topic, but I think we've been... Hang on, we've got ten minutes of time on. Because oh. Johnny took... Yeah, he, we started at ten past... Maybe five. And we've, we've been favouring the people at the front of the house, so what, try someone up the back there, if you do the little sprint with the <coughs> technological device. Thanks. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with the, the notion of keeping politicians accountable for the, the truth or otherwise of what they say. Um, and you have addressed this a little bit in your answers to previous questions, but I'm interested to hear you speak more to the, the practical mechanisms by which we would make this happen. Would, would it be legislative or I mean, would, we, would we make politicians attend press conferences a, attached to polygraphs or what, what would we do? <laughs> um, not the second. Um, no, no, no. What I envisage would be um, a, um, a statutory provision that's modelled on Section 52 but would be somewhat different. It would have to be concerned with politicians' conduct in their capacity as politicians. I think that the, um, it would probably be a good idea to have a filter to make sure you don't get too many nuisance actions going. So there would be some independent statutory authority who could receive complaints and then bring proceedings uh, if they were persuaded that proceeding, proceedings were non-frivolous. Um, and the sanctions, you'd have to think about it carefully, but I think the sanctions would be um, ranging from a fine to temporary suspension in Parliament, possibly to um, um, expulsion from Parliament, although there may be some 
separation of powers problems there, and and ultimately to the possibility of a jail term. Um, but those are details which I readily concede would need to be thought through very carefully. Um, and and the objective ultimately the objective would be that the uh, there was never any need to take a second person uh, to trial and put them in jail. It would be hoped, I think, that the first person to go to jail would be a warning to the rest, because ultimately the point of it is to improve standards, not to c claim scalps. And we'll take one more quick question from up the back. At the very back, an agenda balance, a female person. Otherwise called woman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I definitely agree with you about politicians being held accountable for misrepresenting facts, but in terms of them misrepresenting their opinion, if a party gets elected on the basis of a promise, like say for example um, the Labor Party gets uh, elected in part on the basis of a promise to do something about climate change, if a Labor politician then secretly thinks climate change is crap, but nevertheless is committed to implementing the policy because they believe in the democratic process and that's what they elected by the popular will of the public to do. Is it relevant what is in the confines of that politician's mind? No, because they're not misleading you. But if at the election um, they are asked by an astute journalist what your view is about climate change, then they would face sanctions if their answer was not an honest answer. Now, I, you know, and, and of course, if ultimately, if that party gets in and um, you've got dissidents in the party who don't agree with the policy, then they could either say publicly, I don't agree with the policy, but I have to support it because that's party solidarity, or they could um, uh, say nothing about it. Um, but what they couldn't do is say, yes, I agree with this, I think this is a good idea. Uh, it is about whether they mislead us. I mean, I understand the need for party discipline and all of that, but the point is they can't mislead us about it. And that's where you really would need a bit of astute journalism because you'd need the right journalist to ask the right questions and this is the one thing they don't get, actually get an answer to it. Mm. Okay, look, uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, in, uh, in asking Julian questions, so I've made an executive decision to make Julian available in the bar for another two hours to answer your questions. <laughs> yes. Well, I was going to volunteer. Anyone who buys me <laughs> a glass of wine and can pick my brain. So. so can I ask you all to thank Mr Julian Burnside? <laughs>